Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. So Steve Wozniak is our guest, kind of a new thing we're going to start doing on Twitter. Tom Merritt and I are going to pick some of the most important people in technology and, and uh, subject them to our barrage of questions. And then, Steve, I've got 15 great questions from uh, Twitter. From uh, We asked people if they had a question for you, and if you don't mind, we'll, we'll pose some of those to you as well, Steve. Fantastic. I wish we had more than half an hour. Well, we have as long as you have. I'll keep going oh, until, you, until you hang up on us. Good. <laughs> How's yeah, that sound? <laughs> I don't know. It's live, I guess. <laughs> it's live. So it's, it's live. There's, you know, that's something I learned about some television. The live shows are really Oh, good. let's ask uh, you. Okay, so you've done, recently you did uh, The Big Bang Theory, which was great. You and Janet were both on that, and that was fun. That's but, right. But let's and now go. we got the in with the, with the producers, so we can run down and watch the live tapings of the shows anytime we feel like it. There. We're, we're welcome there. They're gracious to us. It's a live studio audience? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's live. I guess all the shows are that way. And they shoot every scene two times. And after the first one, I the, the writers get to work and they get real busy and they run out and pass some, some cues to the actors. And the, the cast then incorporates the new lines and they're always much funnier. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so the repeat is really good. They do the same thing when they, they tape the show a day before without a live audience. They tape every single scene. They measure the distance to the cameras. They sometimes use a little laser pointer, and um, and they, they measure the distances. They, they, of course, take photographs with an old Polaroid that actually shoots onto paper film, paper pictures. Wow. And... Yeah, it's a real old, real thing. And they take pictures of every table and clothing to make sure they can, you know, keep the continuity. So they wow. have everything in the can Monday. Then Tuesday, they shoot in front of a live audience, and they do two takes of everything. But what if something really went wrong, or they lost some audio, or an actor got sick? They've still got it in the can from the day before, uh -huh. before the live audience. We should do that. <laughs> no. Of course, <laughs> Too much and, work. Of course, yeah, and on the day before, you see, you see them, you know... Uh, shoot a scene sometimes, you know, five times to try to get it right because the lines in Big Bang Theory are so difficult. Sometimes, you know, um, Jim will miss one, you know, and blow it and have to restart. And, Were you a and, fan of the show but, before? Every time you got to laugh. Every time you got to laugh because you got to keep the laughter for the right. soundtrack because in case it doesn't, it has to be covered for the live audience. Right. Were you a fan of the show before you uh, saw it? Or I don't watch television, to be honest. I didn't know what it was when I was invited. Janet looked over the invitation. She said, well, we don't know. We'd have to we'd have to see the show first. And they sent her some DVDs. And she watched two episodes and said, oh, yeah, Steve would love this. It's a great show. Which it's I do now. A lot of fun. So yeah. now I only record two shows on my TiVo. Dancing Sh with the Stars and Big Bang Theory. And um, <laughs> oh, so I you, love that. You, no animosity against Dancing with the Stars. Animosity? That is, it's it, that's a wonderful show. I'm, I'm, you had I'm fun. really into it, and I, I always. The trouble is, every single time I have gotten groups of my friends at our Monday night dinner to sit down with their iPhones, every one of them voting for one person, that person gets kicked off, loses the next day. <laughs> and this time, I did it with my wife and I. We just voted over and over and over for my old dance partner, Karina, dancing with the situation. Yeah, yeah. I really liked him. I thought he was so gracious. I sent her an email and I said, oh, you know. Um, you're lucky to have a gracious part, such a gracious partner. And she said, which one of us? I said, oh, yeah, both of you. <laughs> well, I watched, we watched, my wife and I watched it, and I had never seen the show before, and it was really fun. And we voted for you each each time, of course. And, uh, the, and it was... Leo, really, you I'm not, all I'm going to say is bless you. Bless you. <laughs> well, you Everyone know, who voted for me makes me feel, oh, I got a little bit of distance out of nothing. But, <laughs> did, you, uh, did you come I, away feeling like you're a better dancer now? Did you actually learn? <laughs> Yes, yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I can even go to where we're doing dancing. I, every, every time you go to music and people are out there just dancing, random dancing, um, it has the beats, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I just implement a few of the steps that I've learned, and it works very well. It makes me a much better dancer than just um, an average person, and I had very little time on the show training. I intend to take more lessons with Janet. That must be a great feeling because I, I, I'm one of those people who it sounds like you were up till then where you, you watch people go out and do that and you're really impressed, but there's just no way you could have, ever see oh, yourself no. doing it. I never watched them. I don't watch TV. I'd never seen a show like this. I had no idea what ballroom dancing was. At a wedding, I sit in the chair when everyone else is dancing. I'm the one not dancing. But um, 
but I do, you know, it's a lot of fun to learn. And it's just like, like maybe learning how to take lessons on using your technology or your computers. You know, be patient, learn a little, and it's fun. You don't have to be the world's greatest. So we have lots of questions for you, Steve. Uh, Good. Do, do you mind if we uh, get, give you some listener questions? Oh, you're welcome to start. You or I, either one of us can start. <laughs> I'll give you. I'll give you one. Uh, I know you were very involved in uh, in education. You got your teaching credential. You went back and taught. What, what What is it? Fifth grade you taught, Steve? I didn't get a teaching credential. I always had a desire to teach, so I went back as a volunteer teacher. Volunteer. And okay. by then in California, you didn't. There were ways to teach without a credential in the school. But I decided I, with my expertise in computers, I would teach the kids how to make their homework look good, how to use the computer as a tool for <laughs> normal school stuff. I wasn't going to teach them to be computer geniuses writing programs because then a couple of people excel and the others feel right. left out. I was going to make sure that I helped every single person just do a better job in life. We got a question from Brendan G. He says, what can the average geek do to help improve education in this country? Well, one thing is um, volunteers in schools are very important, you know, and if you have a skill, you're willing to share it and you have a patience and a love of teaching, you can help out. Um, resources are the limitation, and they always will be. Schools are always going to be short of money, and the reason is, is it's old versus young. Like, especially here in California, we have horribly limited, limited school funds due to a proposition that limited how fast property tax rates can go up, and that's where the schools get their money. Right. Well, it turns out that you can have a, a vote in your city to override it. If you have a city that believes in education, Cupertino has a long, long reputation of that, or where I live, Los Gatos, they, they can vote, and it takes two-thirds of the votes to pass to raise the property tax a little bit. Two-thirds of the vote, and only one-third of the people have kids in school, so the other ones don't want to pay for them, right? right. So you wind up uh, with the majority. The problem is a family of five doesn't get any more votes than a family of two. I've been saying this for a decade <laughs> or more, and that's the reason schools are always going to be short on money, because it boils down to votes turn into money right so but you, what you, can you do to help um well one of the things is think about what your real goal is your goal isn't to teach necessarily isn't to teach computers software how they work somebody has a problem in life they have a problem writing a paper okay so writing the paper you don't want to teach you're not really teaching a word processor you are teaching how to write a paper, how to make it effectively convey ideas, how to put graphics in and color, but not overdo it, how to do it in, um, you know, almost kind of a, a, a sort of a professional way and give things a little more style and flair. But whatever you do, as, as if you're trying to help the schools out, try to make the learning fun. Everything in school makes learning, just trying to come up with the right answer, come up with the right answer. And, you know, never, never like a long time to really think about something and absorb it and learn it really well so a lot of people fall behind but um you know but boy you, if you make it one thing i learned was um it's less important what you teach more important that you that you make it fun so the kids want to learn it if they want to learn it they'll sit down and try and um and i you know i was lucky i was a volunteer teacher if they didn't learn it i could reteach it so i had a lot of advantages as far as technology you know you used to go to smart people for answers and, of course, we had libraries, but libraries were cumbersome and mechanical and physical, and you had to get to them. And now, now if you have a tough question, you don't ask a smart person anymore. You ask somebody whose name starts with G-O, like Google. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, David, and, Hatch, uh, David Hatch on Twitter had a question that kind of goes along with this. Uh, he says, do you have any advice for teens getting into programming? What, what do you tell folks to get them excited and make it sound fun? Well, you get into programming, you are learning skills that very few of you have these days. And that puts you out there in a special world. And if you want to be a special person and you love being a master, you know, if you, especially if you, every program that you use, you say, oh, they did, this was wrong, it confused me, I tried to do something a certain way, way A, they wanted it way B, why do they force me? Now you can program, you can learn to program, and you can make your programs exactly the way you want. Not only that, you, you can, um, well, Nowadays, there are so many programs and apps and shareware out there that if you, like, buy a puzzle at a store, somebody might have a solution on the web. But I used to always love to just program my own solutions to puzzles. What a fun thing to do. You know, it doesn't have to be something that's sellable, but the, the feeling you get of having been a master of creating the solution yourself is, is just so great. And the technical skills, you have to learn 
so many little details that add up and add up and add up to um, you know complete programs. You have to start with small pieces, learn some techniques, learn some more, learn how to you know make the right calls. You have to learn. It's a big learning curve now, but boy, that is. Um, to a lot of people, that's the sort of learning we like. It's like mathematics. You learn small things first. They lead you into bigger things, which lead you to bigger things. And it's an almost never-ending path. And if it's fun for you, do it. And if it's not, find something that is. Do you have a favorite language, something you uh, would recommend kids learn? We learned basic I, when we got started, right? That's, that's what I learned. Actually, you probably did uh -huh. assembler, right? Basic was easy, but basic was so limited because right. you couldn't write a routine and share it. Right. You couldn't write a part of a program and share it with someone else. So we moved on to languages like Pascal and Algol. And, um, you know, I, but I actually, I always preferred, especially in my classes, which were, uh, you know, primary students, um, I preferred scripting languages, the ones that kind of had a feeling more like English. And three that I really favored for classwork were Logo, which mm -hmm. I found to have limits. It does some things very nicely. But the concepts, you don't really learn them in second grade. You don't learn them in third grade. You don't learn them in fifth grade. You kind of have to be up to that algebra level in your mind where you've passed a cognitive development stage called symbolic reasoning mm -hmm. right. before you can really understand what programs are. So I'd say hold off programming till about seventh grade, or they can do a lot of things, but only a very, very few select kids can really learn it and understand it and write their own programs in the end. We but Logo, Logo was a little limited. Um, we had a whole generation of kids who are, who are adults now who learned turtle graphics with Logo, and I don't mm -hmm. see a whole bunch of new programmers because of it. So I think you're right. I think Logo... But you, get, you get through a, some early stages, and you get immediate feedback, which is right. very good. Now, with, hypercard. with our HyperCard system, loved we had that. HyperTalk by Bill Atkinson. I loved that. This was my favorite ever. It was a whole world before the Internet. You had a world where you could called air, other things, you could simply type a command that puts up a menu, puts items in the mm. menu for each I, one of those items in the menu, you could give it a, a program of what to do, and it read very English-like, and then we had AppleScript, and I loved AppleScript for simple little quick things that had some user interface and some immediate response, and it looked very English-like, so I wrote program after program after program in all three of those languages, and every time HyperTalk that came with HyperCard was a smaller program, read more naturally in English as to what it was doing, and was faster. So um, I think it's because of the artistry that went into developing that language. Bill, that the person who, Bill Atkinson Bill's was behind this. Amazing. And he is that yeah. You know, a lot he's of got, people he's are... Got, he's got my, my, my favorite new app on the iPhone. Um, it's called PhotoCard. Yeah, he's a photographer now. He's a photographer, but with PhotoCard... You can simply take a picture of your own or some of his stock photos that are great natural photography, and you can create a, f a realistic looking postcard with a front picture of your own and a backside that you can pull in some little print shop style stamps and you can type a message, you can pull, put the address of who it's going to, the email address, and it sends it as email. But if you pick somebody's real physical home address, it sends it as a real postcard right That's from the cool. app on your That's iPhone. So cool. You have to buy a few credits. You have to buy some credits. It costs money. Bill actually has printers that are printing these things up with a, a quality of print that will last 50 years on the picture, and they get mailed. So I'm can having actually fun. might actually, actually show up before people. you get home from your trip. <laughs> yeah, probably yeah, would. Just, you could impress somebody by sending them email instead of a paper letter, and now you can really impress people by sending them a real paper postcard in the mail with a picture you just took on your iPhone. Do you stay in touch with Bill? I don't stay in touch with anybody too much, but I see Bill now and then. And, um, you know, we, we, I wish we, I, you know, some people you just, you're, you're always friends with and you want to get together when you can. Yep. So I saw him, I saw him recently and uh, we're planning to get together again soon. But none of the, uh, none of the old Apple guys you really, uh, you really keep up with? Sure. I mean, a Bill a little bit. Um, Andy Hertzfeld, um, a, a, a rather a bit. Um, Randy Wigginton, you know, some people through email, but not... Um, not huge quantities of them. My my sort of my sphere of being known in the world is so large. I have hundreds of friends, you have I mean, a lot thousands of friends, of, yeah. thousands of Facebook friends, and I'm restricted on who gets in. And I still don't know <laughs> them personally. I know the name. Now, when you we're talking about programming, I, I hear a lot of people concerned that with the new platforms for phones, and not, I'm not just talking about the iPhone, but for Android and WebOS and all of these, that they're restricted in what you can do. And because of that, we may be losing something that you had when you had access to the entire hardware back in the day. What, what's your feeling on that? Or is, is this a problem or not? 
it's a huge problem. Don't forget, I'm one of the founders of the EFF and have always been for open systems. And what, what bothers me is when there is something in a device or a service on the Internet or the web itself, the, the network access, when there's something in it that somebody else had to actually put money, effort, parts, and resources in to turn off that you want, that the users want. And that always bothers me when I know it's just in there and why can't I do it? Uh, let me think. One example is, okay, I got my iPad and I thought, hey, it'd be neat to make a Skype phone call. Uh, but <laughs> nope. I can pair it. So I can pair the iPad with my Bluetooth keyboard, yeah. probably with a Bluetooth mouse. I don't know if that works. But um, I could not pair it with a Bluetooth headset. And I thought somebody just restricted it. And then they came up with somebody noted that you could plug into the USB. Right. With my little my little headset. headset. You got me onto a headset once, Leo. Yep. Plantronics. And yep. I used it. And I plugged it into the... To the, the uh, I took it down to my Segway polo practice one day and made one phone call to Janet. And that was great. And I left it... Oh, well, it was laying on the table. Somebody oh, no. swiped the little Plantronics connector that connects the... <laughs> oh. the um, the phono plugs to right. a USB. Right. So I had to go and order a whole new Plantronics that I'm wearing today <laughs> to replace it. And it doesn't have that nice, beautiful, standardized connector. But that's another story. I did make the phone call. I can make a phone call. I tried it. Um, then I tried it on an iPod Touch recently. And the iPod Touch doesn't work with the Bluetooth headset plugged in um, for Skype or Line 2. But it does work if you plug in Apple's little ear set with the microphone. You can make VoIP calls. So, you know, anyway, I forget what got us onto this. <laughs> well, just the, was, the restrictions. It, like, uh, the but, res but, yeah, it's, yeah. Like, it's like, why are these phony restrictions? Why are there any of these restrictions at all when I want to do something? Maybe I really it won't change my life a lot, but it gives me one more avenue when I need it. You know, the, you know, um, VoIP calls wherever you are. I mean, I try to do that. So I'm a big experimenter all the time trying to figure out ways to do things and, and ways I can carry um, – uh, things like MiFi's, and you probably don't know what the cheapest MiFi at Verizon is. Well, there's a uh, there's cheapest a Virgin, there's a Virgin cheapest. Atlantic one, which is I think thirty or forty bucks a month. Because Sprint, okay. Sprint, Sprint went, owns a Verizon, Virgin Mobile. At Verizon, yeah, you buy a Palm Pre and don't uh -huh. pay for a That's voice right. plan. Only the right. data plan, thirty bucks a month. Is that and what you use a Pre? Free MiFi. And you get the full five gigabytes, the same as the MiFi they sell. <laughs> See, this is one thing I really like about you, was is you never lost that spirit of hacking, of inquiry, of pushing the envelope. This actually ties into no, a question. You do, but you do more than I do, Leo, because people are constantly sending you products and saying, test this, try it out, try it out. You and guys like David Pogue, except you kind of get paid for it, and I pay to do it. <laughs> you know, this is a decision I made very early on, Steve. I said, I want to own the latest, greatest things. It was actually back in your day. It was in the, it was in the late 70s when Apple was going great guns. And I said, the only way I can do this is by making this a profession that I cover this stuff, and then you can get the latest and greatest. Guy That Sits, his real name is Brian, asks on Twitter, a related question. Do you still see the world the same way uh, today as you did 20 years ago? Has, has, has your outlook about the world changed? Do you still have that same enthusiasm? Seems that you do. I have the same enthusiasm about technology. The things that are important to me, my you know core values and personality don't change much. I don't think they do in this time frame of your life. You know, uh, 20 years ago, I was 40. Now I'm 60. Right. So, by the um, way, happy birthday! You had a Janet threw you a massive birthday party at the Computer uh, Muse Tech Museum, Museum of Tech. It was on unbelievable. Way. It was unbelievable. But the biggest thing is nobody fools me when a lot of people know, and I got totally fooled on this. You one. did? No oh, kidding. good. Because I accidentally it, it, showed the the invitation on the screen, <laughs> and I thought, whatever you do, don't tell Waz and don't tell Janet. I'm more afraid of Janet than I am. Well, it was, first of all, it was two weeks past my real birthday, so that right. kind of covered it. And she said she had something, um, a, an exhibit she worked on. Her department, she works for Apple. She worked on it down at the, the tech, and would I go down and see it? And I said, do we have to? Yeah, yeah, yeah I work. <laughs> so I said, I'm just going to stay for five or ten minutes. You can stay longer. I'm going to go out to eat after that. <laughs> and we, we arrived, and the first thing I told the head of the tech museum is he walked me in. I said, look, I'm not going to be here long. I'm just going to be here and go. <laughs> and so Okay, funny. okay, okay. Walked downstairs, and there's all these cameras. I'm thinking, wow, this is a pretty important exhibit. It must be the press. <laughs> and I recognized my friends in there, and I'm trying to think, what the heck? <laughs> so uh, I got taken, and I have not been, and I am, I pride myself on being able to send small little clues and you know, pick things out of what people say. And You have to like in self-defense. You're a prankster, which means people are always going to try to prank you back. <laughs> right. Well, I'm also a joke player. I like to play just fun tricks and surprises on people myself. That was another but, uh, Twitter question we got was what what are some of your most recent pranks? You still pranking? 
I am pranking all the time. The trouble is, it's so much all the time that I don't make lists. It's like you see movies. I saw five movies in the last month, maybe, and I don't even remember which ones they were. <laughs> I might remember a couple when I pull them up. Um, and I know I have pulled some really great pranks lately, um, but I didn't come prepared. If I if I sit down alone and think it out for a while, they come into my mind which ones I did. How do you plan a prank? Do you pick your target first and then plan the prank around the target, or do you pick a fun? Like I remember the the antenna yeah. detuner that you did in college. That was a um, gadget that, was, that you were able to use. It's a gadget, and it made TVs look like they were going out of order. But um, <laughs> those and those those are kind of easy. They're a little more direct and brute force. Sometimes I've spent actually months planning pranks that involve things like women's panties, even. But um, <laughs> you want to share like, that with to, us, Steve? <laughs> well, I I, I I got a guy. I, I had season tickets to basketball, and got this guy who's a police chief to. Uh, you know, he was going to bet me if I could get something going on with this one girl he kept looking at and following around while I played my Game Boy at the games. <laughs> and, and uh, well, it turned out that I got introduced by my book co-writer, Gina Smith, whom you know well. Very well. She introduced me to David Wharton, who wrote Ask for Jeeves. Did Ask for Jeeves? Oh, yeah. Ask Jeeves. Yeah. And he came by, and I said, wait a minute. I know, you, you go to the basketball game. You sit down next to that lady. He said, that's my wife. <laughs> so, are you into pranks? Oh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, basically, basically, I won a bet. <laughs> but it was a hustle. And I, I love the hustle, even to this day. But um, sometimes I get wrong numbers. I love to play with wrong numbers because my phone numbers are repeating digits. And a lot of times, people will leave a phony number. And they love to leave. 888888. Sure. Well, that reaches sure. me now. Yeah. And uh, it's a very difficult experience, technical experience I made to make that phone call work. But if people call me and they say, oh, is Julie there? I say, well, she's in the shower with a friend. <laughs> she's getting dressed. <laughs> you know, and one time a father goes, whoa. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, he was, <laughs> uh, he was a little upset. Or I'll go in there in the hot tub or, uh, <laughs> you know, or I'll play along. You always say, first rule of improv comedy is always say yes. And I tend to do that and lead people on. And it's fun. And it's partly, it's a little like, you know, it's better if... if technology is involved with these pranks a bit and i forgot what i was going to lead into but it was um something that involved technology and one of these oh yes the way i get my numbers on all my all, i had the number eight 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 it was the prime number of my life i've had it for 20 25 years and i've never been able to use it because 100 babies a day dial eight 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 out of the san jose area my area code in my area code and i hear at the end i hear a baby they don't talk i can't <laughs> want them to listen to me i hear sounds in the background of the family or tv's going and i never get anywhere well finally i, I heard, okay google voice came along and i said Google Voice, you nice. dial a number, and it has some filtering. The trouble is the only filtering I could do on Google Voice was if you are calling from a number in my Google contact list, it'll forward it to my phones. And if you're not in my Google contact list, all it could do is right. hang you up with a message saying you're not in my list. Right. That stops the babies, but it stops everyone. Mm. So I couldn't hand out the number. Then I heard about this service, talktome.com. Yeah. And so, I, so my Google Voice, I vectored it. So if you're in my Google contact list, it instantly calls my phones. Otherwise, it forwards the message to my talktome.com number, which has the ability. I have to pay a few bucks a month for that one. But I have the ability to say, press 1 for Steve. And no baby can press 1. <laughs> so finally, finally, I can use this number that's so great. And I have these metal name cards, kind of like business cards. And my next version of them, I've got a little printout that's sort of like the old punch cards, you know, where the holes were 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And I just punched out the holes where my phone number is instead of writing it in text. You haven't had a baby get through that yet, huh? <laughs> no, I haven't had babies get through, although some adults get through. Because but because people leave a phony number sometimes. They they go online, sign up for some service or whatever, and they just leave 888888. They, sure. they just dial a random thing that's easy to dial. And I get calls back, and you're not, they're not calling for Steve. And I'm getting, I used to play pranks on them or joke with them or pretend I was the person. Now I'm very polite and help them out as quick as I can to figure out what's wrong. I also have another problem with a number that starts 888. That's a, now they made that an area code that's for free calls. Right. right. So if you dial one, if you're in San Jose, you dial one, 888, and some numbers to get to some businesses. But if you don't dial the one, some of those businesses come to me. <laughs> So, um, that's, and that's been true all along, and I've had some fun. They come to all my phones. All my phone numbers start 888-888-something. So. Somebody tell me, don't, date, don't take Waz in the car with you because he will slip ladies' underwear into your <laughs> glove compartment. 
with that? Oh, no, the, no, no, no. The bet at the basketball game was just that I could get her underwear, so I bought some at Victoria's Secrets. And this guy had a fetish for smelling women. Ooh. Oh, so I, so, I, so I put perfume on it, and <laughs> he sniffed it, and he said, it is hers. Oh, my God. <laughs> And then everyone sitting around me at the basketball game was thinking, how did you do that? Ah, he's smart. He got her underwear. All right, this is from Corey M.W. You're going to have to put your thinking cap on for a Corey's question. Okay. You're chosen to be the liaison to our first alien visitors. What would be the first thing you would say to them and the first gadget you would give them? You're our first human to contact, to talk to aliens... What would you tell them, and what would you give Darn them? Because I go right back to um, thinking um, we, we don't speak the same language. Mm -hmm. You see, you're and now being so, logical so about out, this. So what, I, yeah, so what I would start out, so I, 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 no, I, I, eight, I eight, eight. what I would do is try to communicate numbering systems, exactly. and I might, I might bring a pencil and paper, or it might be an iPad, and I would write numbers, but tap once. Tap two for two. Yeah. Start teaching numbers first because there's easy formulas for it. Basically, you know, you have your hands, you have your gestures, and you, that's how you have to start communicating. As far as so a you say math gadget, is the, math is oh. the universal language, so that's a great way to start. Yep, yep, yep. As far as a gadget goes, it might be a television because I think there's a lot of comedy in video that you don't need to understand the language mm, and the words to um, to be entertained. And if you know what people laugh at, you learn a lot. You know about a lot about them, don't you? That says a lot about who they are. Yeah, of yeah. course. Just give a computer. It could have programs on it. It can have songs. It can have mm -hmm. uh, lessons. It can have you know everything a computer reaches, and my, including the internet. That would obviously be the, the the primary one. You know, at least an iPad. By the way, talk to me is I I tried to type in t t a l k. It's t o k t u m i dot com. Oh, is that go. that's the service you were talking about, Steve? Yeah, t and they're also associated with that new uh, Line Two that you can get on your oh, iPhone. Oh yeah, and I yeah, got, yeah. I got it on mine. Played all these games. The trouble is when I make an, a Line Two call, which uses VoIP, so my call won't get dropped right. when I'm at home. When I when I make a call on it, the caller ID doesn't. I can't set the caller ID to show up as my main phone number that I prefer they call me back at 888888 mm -hmm. so um but google um, voice is supposedly going to fix that pretty soon they're going to give you get, let you choose the number that the caller id shows so no, you google I, voice google voice does that oh they do do google that now. Voice okay does, but this line two pro doesn't this do line it. two doesn't although you, they say that you can but the, i don't think i didn't see where you you can port your number into it but i'm not going to port any of my valuable numbers anywhere except i ported 888888 to google not the way that normal people do. I did it before they made it available, right. and they actually put it on equipment in their sites that they couldn't they couldn't scale that for everyone. So no. I got a special only a special. special. Deal. They own my number. I have to get it back from them someday. <laughs> you moved. I remember you moved because you couldn't get decent cell <laughs> decent cell signal in your old. <laughs> isn't that right? In your old house. It was one justification for moving. Okay, that's that's a better way to put it. But yeah. it was um it was an important one. <laughs> Can you get a decent signal now? I, I get pretty good signals on Verizon and AT and T at when I'm at my home and not moving. <laughs> I, a lot of my AT and T calls do get dropped, um, mm -hmm. you know, but they don't get dropped like every minute, like when I'm in San Francisco. Oh, it's terrible in the city. Yeah. So, uh, what phone do you use? You said you have a Palm Pre. Obviously, you have an iPhone. Sure, I have three iPhones that are active. One of them, one of them has actually two of them have a rare, rare grandfathered. International unlimited data Ooh. for sixty four bucks a month, and of course, when I bought the new iPhone, I had a big run in. I I went down to the AT and T store three times to make sure they would verify I wouldn't lose my my unlimited international data if I got a new iPhone with the new account, the new number in the Apple store. I wouldn't give them my credit card to buy the new iPhone until they and and a supervisor of the store assured me I would not lose any of the the plans of my account, the mm -hmm. details, the features of my phone account. And then I ran down to the AT&T store after I bought the new iPhone, and I still had unlimited international data. The, wow. next day, my, the next day, my wife and I in the evening went to the AT&T store. I still had international data. Whew, good. I lived. The next day, I flew to Bogota, Colombia, and when I landed, I had no international data plan whatsoever. They thought my back was turned, and they swiped it. 
Murphy's and Law. I, got, I went to running with them, you know, because of my, my name, eventually it got to the media person, I meaning PR. And, oh, right. yes, we got your unlimited international data back. And I, I really never use it. I, I only got it a long time ago because I got to Germany and half a day I had a $7,000 phone bill. Oh, and, you know, I said, I always travel so much. I always have an international plan. I must have lost it when I bought my new iPhone. So they gave me the plan and they gave me the 7000 bucks back. But that's a very valuable plan. And I don't, I don't want to ever lose these uh -huh. kind of neat plans. Yeah. I've also got an unlimited domestic data grandfathered on one of my two Verizon MiFi's. Wow. So, those, yeah. so, so I took one of my iPhones. Anyway, we're back on iPhones. I have three iPhones. One is my main one. It's totally neutral, normal, untouched with my favorite apps, and I test the apps all the time to weed it down to not having hundreds, but only having dozens and you know, on the phone. And then I have another phone that I kind of jailbroke so that I can run it as a MiFi in Europe. So if I ever go to Europe and I need data because the internet's not working in my hotel or something, ah, I have a backup. It's my own iPhone with unlimited data. Do you, do you keep reason, it on a particular firmware version, or do you continually upgrade and, and jailbreak it? No, I have it back uh, 4.0. But really? um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, but that's, remember, that's a second iPhone, and it's not the one that I use as my primary. It's the one I use as a backup battery. If my battery runs down, I have a second iPhone with all the same apps. If I want to multitask, hold one phone to my ear, I can look <laughs> at the other one to look something up, and I don't have to, you know, break in the middle of the no, it's really good for multitasking. <laughs> but um, th that one and that one, I you know, it, the thing is, I it, it'll 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 pair. It won't it won't actually be a MiFi to my iPad or my iPhone. For some reason, they can't connect to its style of stupid. It's a MyWi program, but it can hmm. feed my uh, MacBook Pro if I'm really desperate, never need. And I have a third iPhone that I bought to experiment with the AT&T plan for tethering. So I got the tethering plan. Then I added an international plan. And yes, it will tether internationally. I only have 50 megabytes on my plan, which is horribly expensive. You know, oh, yeah. why is the internet free? But these data plans are... Oh, Don't get me started, things. Steve. You know, the, you, I figured it out once. If you pay 20 cents a text message, you're paying $1,500 a megabyte to send text messages. I mean, it's outrageous. $1,500 a megabyte. Not well, thank God, thank God, um, uh, pictures a thousand words. At least <laughs> text messages are only words. So uh, are you going to get a Windows phone? Did you see the new yeah, Windows yeah. Phone 7? Do you I, like that? I heard such good comments on it. Yeah. I, I, I like to hold off all my comments about how good something is right. until I actually have it in my Me hand. Yep. That one merits actually getting and trying. And I also, I also have a Droid X that I use. I love my Android there, X, I have to say. You know what? And, and there are a lot of things I don't like about Android. It is more complicated, doesn't make as good enough sense to my human brain as the iPhone does. Mm -hmm. The iPhone, everything is easy and straight and fun and comfortable. But um, Droid X has some beautiful things about it, including speaking to, I can speak, you Isn't know, navigate great? to. Yeah. And the iPhone, you can speak some things, but it doesn't do as good a job with your voice. Google sends your voice up to their supercomputers. And even when I'm in a loud concert and my voice is just barred out top to bottom, you know, with all the background noise, it understands what I said. Mm -hmm word for word correctly. I, I am so amazed at that voice technology. I really think that's the next step for um, a lot of products is to let you say things naturally in many, many ways, the same way you should type them into Google queries. Do you think we'll continue to have multiple platforms like this, kind of the way we were with computers in the 80s? Or do you think it's going to consolidate into a, a more of a, a war of two people or less, two platforms or less, I should say? I don't know. I've never, I've never looked at that or studied it. Um, I. It, Which do you it, think would be better to to have? Well, one oh one platform is better. I mean, look at yeah. like GSM is worldwide, for example, or Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is a worldwide one standard works everywhere. It is so thankful. G um, GPS satellites, you know, just one standard works everywhere. Um, so thankful when we have that. Um, it's, you know, I, and I, I hate the restrictions. I wish you could move between platforms. You know, have one program on one platform and have it accept and adapt and sync with, especially, you know, syncing phones with all these things, syncing phones with, um, you know, the, well, the new internet televisions are coming out. I don't know why they, they missed this, but you better be able to sync it with your mobile devices. I kind of want to, you know, feel sync, that everything sync what? I'm used to. Sync data, sync TV apps? shows? What would Absolutely. You... Sync, sync data, some, some apps on the phones, some... Yeah. Um, I, th I think um, I think that uh, the, the the internet televisions eventually should build in the ability to have 
some email and some web browsing. They say the web is dead. Um, I, I don't, I don't buy so. that. No. I don't buy that. I think it's a, a mix. One person. And, yeah. So, so as long as you have that built in, well, syncing things like your contact list, your calendars um, should just happen automatically with, you know, all your phones. Yeah, we're moving. I, I, don't, I don't like the restrictions. That it's kind of like you know, well, you can get an iPhone and and it syncs well with iTunes, or I guess you you know, in other platforms, you kind of get locked in. You get Amazon dot com for your for your music on the. You're like all us geeks. You but want Google it all tries, just to... Google, Google tries to make things open. At least I really like right. the fact that right. when they came out with their Android system, it gave you a choice. The first one I ever had had a choice for search engine of Google or Yahoo or Bing. Right. And I said, oh, my gosh, they aren't really closing you in. Apple at the time only had Google. Now Apple's opened it up to um, Yahoo, I think, or Bing. Bing. One of, one of them. Here's a question from uh, the uh, Twitter from Monkey. Are you on Twitter, Waz? Well, I'm on a bunch of social networks, usually as Steve Waz. Okay. And the trouble is, and that's everything, but the trouble is every time I go into one of them, I, I mean, Twitter, I, I, I have so much email. I get through the email that I was the first part in my life, the first thing. I don't have time left over. I'm so tired. If, if, I, if I'm even awake, I can barely open my eyes enough to maybe play a short computer game or something. I, I don't have time to go into Facebook and try to hang around and answer. Everyone tries to hit me up instantly. Same thing with iChat uh, on my computer. Everyone starts hitting me up. And, it, you know, if you have lack of time and, and you're tired and sore, it's, it's a big hassle. So I rarely Twitter. I think Twitter is great. I absolutely wish it were a big part of my life. I would love to tweet things. Um, and I was using Foursquare for a while. But the problem with Foursquare, I linked it up to Twitter and, and Facebook. I see it on your so Facebook. You're checking in all the time on Facebook. I see that, yeah. Is that still happening? Well, I, I sort of... I, I what happened was I, check. I did it for a while. I don't think so. I did it for a while. You were checking in all time, the time. I, every time I went to a restaurant, <laughs> you know, it would be like 200 people were telling me what to order there. <laughs> and I didn't need... And they all <laughs> no. almost talked to me like they expect you to be answering them. Right. <laughs> and, reading, and I was, and I was, I was reading every one of them, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I do not have time for this, you know, just telling them, you know, where I'm going, and they're hearing their comments about the place. I have too many friends, this problem, on Facebook. No, you are not checking in anymore. I'm just looking here. You don't check in. I don't see I, the check-ins. I turned off. I, yeah. I turned that off because it was just, and I didn't turn, I want people to know what kind of a life I have, what restaurants I go to, what music shows, what concerts I'm at, um, what city I'm in. I, I used to also update my, um, travel i use tripit.com mm -hmm. love tripit which you love i love it when i first got it because i can just email my itineraries to plans mm -hmm. at tripit.com awesome? but here's where i here's where i got real negative about it real negative because i travel a lot and i was on a lot of airplane flights and i got at least four apps on my iphone that all sync up with tripit.com right to get their information Right. Every one of them, I would land in a plane and start trying to look up which gate are we landing at. They'd have wrong information or no information. Where's my baggage going to be? They wouldn't tell me. And I know those apps used to tell me in the past when all they knew was my flight number. They, every one of them started failing. There was one time it, it told me, one was saying my flight, the, actually it, at least two were saying my flight was coming out of Terminal 3 and it was really out of Terminal 4 and I'm waiting in the wrong lounge. And I finally said, forget it. I go, to, I go to an airport, I have to look at the signs to see where my baggage claim is, where my gate really is. I have to ask questions manually. I couldn't trust TripIt, so I just turned those apps. I, I take an app, and I don't link it to TripIt. I just type in a flight number, and it gets all the info I want so well. That TripIt service is a piece of love junk. And it's got <laughs> I love TripIt. I, I, if I had the experience you did, I'd hate it too. <laughs> the online user interface has... Simple things that I want to do are so difficult to find the way to do it. It's like it was written by, I, I hate to say it, Windows people instead of Macintosh people. I, I, I give you, if I had that experience, I'd hate it too. But what I, I, I use it in a very limited fashion, which I, I send the email, and then it gives me my times and everything. That's kind of all I rely on it for. Uh, but you're right. If you, if you try to push it too far, I think... I tried, well, it was yeah. the same thing with the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Something went terribly wrong. See, and also, I just use the TripIt trip app. It, I don't use any not, others. Not, TripIt would not even know itself. Even the TripIt app was the worst of them all. It wouldn't know what gate you're landing at, and all the others are displaying it. I now, I'm gonna, now I'm going to worry. I'm not. I'm going to use it tomorrow. On uh, has it done that for me? World. I mean, now I'm scared. I used it for New York this week. It was fine. I'm maybe scared. they maybe they went through a, a period like, where they were having server difficulties. What app did you use on your iPhone? The TripIt app. Trip yeah, app. I just yeah. use the TripIt app. I don't use any oh. third party apps.
Well, I had a lot of experience, some some in, in the States and some out of the States, and huh. the TripIt app was... Um, Good to know. Others, the others did a great job without the TripIt, and when they were connected to getting their info from TripIt, they also were in the blank and didn't know the answers, so... Let me give but you just me. let me give you Monkey Sticks question because I started it but I but I didn't finish it. He wanted to know if you are nostalgic about any old computer systems or models. Any I mean even the I guess even in the Apple and the oh, one and two. Yeah. Where, where do you nostalgic uh, about, Steve? I'm nostalgic about um, very often people email me these things, so I see it frequently. So I have good reason to be nostalgic. And I don't I'm not in the crowd that still goes back and uses their Apple Ones and Apple Twos. Like Sheldon. Nostalgic. Like Sheldon I see an who Apple had his two E and was gonna get you to sign it on Big Bang Theory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm nostalgic about a lot of the Apple II programs that I remember, especially oh, yeah. the text based ones, the text based adventure type games, you yep. know, the early days. Zork. And I I'm I wanna go back. I like I have an Apple II emulator. Oh gosh, I think it's on my droid right now. Mm -hmm. And but I've got to go out and find files that other people compressed of their old floppies of the programs, or I've got to have a lot of time to create my own. So what can I, you? I what, want to what, go back can, and play Zork. Zork would and, be fun. Yep. And but but the, uh, I'm also very nostalgic for the Apple II C. The first computer oh. was like the size of today's laptops. Yeah, it was beautiful. It had to plug it in the wall. Was all. It didn't have a battery. Right. It had. They had an LCD screen you could put on it. That one I loved, and you could plug a board in that had CPM and extra memory. Uh, that was really one of my favorites. And the Duo Macintosh yep. was so small and light, like today's iPad kind of. And I could just carry that everywhere, and, and it had just enough RAM that I was able to run it as a RAM disk for the data, part of the RAM, and the rest of the RAM is RAM. And I could compress all, all the files that I used the most, like Claris Works and and uh, everything just open it up. It's running instantly. It's like it was never sh really shut down. That was a very, um, it was like twice as fast. I yeah. loved my, my year with that duo. What, uh, uh, what is the oldest computer you still have lying around the house? Um, well, I have Apple I boards and I have Apple IIs, even at least one in a box, maybe a couple in boxes. I, uh, so those are pretty old. Uh, Altair? I never had an Altair. I couldn't afford one. I had to build my own. You never picked one up later. And you know, a good thing that never he couldn't. Did. No, I, I just want to say, I, I didn't keep very much stuff in my. That all the Macintoshes, yeah. one after another, after another, passed through my life because I'm always trying to have the latest, and and I never keep them, so I don't have any kind of museum of my own like a lot of people do. Yeah, well, I kept one. I kept one. I kept my. I actually kept my. Um, whatever PowerBook uh, 1400. Oh, yeah. I don't know why everyone hated that one. I loved it, and I loved the fact you could slip your own pictures under the clear top. And <laughs> we got the Digibarn guys me. down there in Santa Cruz taking care of the. That's right, the, the uh, collection. So. Have you been down there to the Digibarn? Uh... Yes, I have, and that's amazing. I mentioned that to an awful lot of people. Do you have a that's... PC? Do you have a Windows PC? Was I don't currently have a Windows PC. I've had to have them in the past. Um, the last time I really had to have one was um, writing code for a certain processor a few years ago, and I just used I used one of the emulators on the uh, the Macintosh. Yeah, I was going to say, do you virtualize or do you do boot camp or do you just not even bother with it unless you need I, it? I don't I don't bother now, but I I have some there's some parts of my life that might need to again go back and revisit it. You know, so Apple's know Apple stock hit three hundred dollars today, Steve. That must does it is that. Does that do anything for you when you hear a statistic like that? Does it amaze you? Does it surprise you? Does it, or are you detached from it now? Or no, I think it's well deserved. I think a lot of really good things have been done right at Apple to get to that point. I'm, I very much admire the company, yeah. and the price of the stock absolutely represents the quality of the products. You know, and it's not just you know as long as Apple makes such good products, they're going to have this massive following that by instantly buying everything, they set the path. It's like we're creating the path and everyone else kind of has to travel on the worn path after us. Yep. So Taylor Bell uh, wrote on Twitter a, a historical question. He said, I also would like to know why you named it Apple. Well, Steve Jobs came up with the name and it was, I was very shy, never intimidated. I was very undemeaning, whatever the word is. I, I wouldn't ask people, where did you get ideas? I never asked. I always assumed. I knew he worked on orchards up in Oregon, and he had just come back from Oregon on a plane flight when he told me the name. Well, funny thing is, on the very last night of my uh, season on Dancing with the Stars, a doctor who had helped treat my uh, terrible hamstring. Oh, man, did you get hurt? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the doctor, um, that doctor sat down and said that his brother worked with Steve on that farm up in Oregon. Really? And that his brother had given Steve the name. No kidding. <laughs> 
So, so it actually has a real start. And I think there were even apple trees there. I was always worried that well, maybe it was just some drug plantation. <laughs> <laughs> did you, when he said apple, did you care? Did it? Did you say, yeah, that sounds fine? Well, you know, it was sort of stunning. My first response was, what about Apple Records? The Beatles record right. company is right. the most famous in the world. That's and a I didn't prescient you question. Yeah. And Steve said, said, well, they're a record company. We're a computer company. We'll never do music. I said, and I was so young. And I said, well, that's all you need. And he was younger than me. He says, yeah, that's all. So, <laughs> oh, he knows. <laughs> and, and so, it, but, you know, both of us actually, to be honest, both of us didn't just instantly accept it. We tried to think of technical combinations of words like, you know, the power compute. Right. Dot, you know, the power compute. You didn't even need a dot com back then. Right. And we couldn't come up with anything as good as Apple computer. And we did we did have to talk our way through our once we raised money and we had a PR department, um, Regis McKenna. Um, oh yeah. We they, they tried to convince us that it didn't represent computing, this word Apple. We said, No, computers are gonna go into the personal world, the wow. home world. And wow. Apple's a good name. You knew even then. You were right. Well, we kind of had to stand our ground because after you come up with a great name, you don't want to give it up. Right. Do you the, remember any of the other names you tossed aside? I do not. They were there was yeah. nothing, nothing even. The remotely. first logo had a picture of uh, Sir Isaac Newton under a tree. Don't call it a logo. Oh. It was way too complicated to sketch drawing. <laughs> it was a drawing designed by our our early third partner, Ron Wayne. Right. Yeah, he drew it, and it was a very beautiful picture. And if you know anything about logos, they have to be simple. So it was not a logo. But it was right. a cool idea. It was a nice drawing, a much better picture than a logo could be. Yeah, yeah Newton under the apple tree. Yeah, you're right. It wasn't a logo, was it? But, and, and it was and it was Ron Wayne's own idea. Yeah, that well, it, it, was, it fit. Mm -hmm. uh, what technological advancement do you see? This comes from Jonathan Rowley. And by the way, actually, I should give credit uh, to all hail Daniel, Daniel Bryan, who asked that question if you own a PC. Uh, Jonathan Rowley asks... Because, you know, they get a big kick, uh, uh, Waz say. <gasps> my question got asked. Waz answered my question, so I'll make sure they get credit. Uh, what you know, I'll, I'll tell you something, Leo. I go and I give talks a lot of times. And when I speak to young people especially, like Campus Party, I don't know if you ever heard of that, but thousands of people. I was in Mexico City recently. It's all in Hispanic countries so far. Next year it'll be in the United States at um, Moffett Field, Ames, NASA Ames here in um, Mountain View. But I went down to, to uh, Mexico City. It was the third one I went to this year. And 6,000 young people, mostly college age wow. and a little above, that come, they, they pay 100 bucks to camp out in tents for a week. They fill an, an entire expo hall with tents. Then they fill another expo hall with tables and they put their computer stations at the tables. There's a lot of security um, measures to make sure your stuff doesn't get stolen. And they just work on their computers for a week, you know. And it's not a LAN party just to play games. It's a lot of a lot of programmers there and a lot of creativity work and a lot of presentations. So I spoke at that. And after I speak to young people, you know, it means a lot more to them to actually come up and get to talk to you. Sure or get an autograph sure or a picture. Does. So I would stay for hours afterwards. Oh, that's great. You know, rather than, rather than uh, let them down and just disappear like you got to hear me speak, you know. You, you must be aware of your historical importance, right? I mean... I, I wasn't for a long time exactly, but now I have a pretty good handle on it and where it comes from. Yeah. And it's just, you know... So for these you know, young people, it's like meeting Sir Isaac Newton. I mean, it's meeting somebody who will be known forever. And because I really didn't want that, and I didn't even want this corporate world, and I didn't really do that much after the early days and what I started, but when I go back, you can go back and read my book, and you'll find that... One little step after another, after another, building device after device after device, really, you know, caused a lot of this to get its early kick. Yep. Yep. So I look back, and if, if I look down, I was at a um, music concert one year. We were replanning another Us Festival. This was a few years ago, and I looked down at this crowd dancing in a nightclub, and I thought out to myself, if all those guys down there were the leaders of the world, the technology leaders, the company leaders, the presidents and politicians, and one of those guys down there was just some young guy, and he had like created the first personal computer that was really had the formula right, that guy would be my hero if he was the symbol. Of course. So, you know, I all, you. all of a sudden I understood <laughs> that this personal computer is so important to yes. people. That, um, I don't know. I didn't really ever seek this kind of notoriety, but I try to be a, a good symbol if I'm going to be one. It's nice that you can have the perspective and enjoy that a little bit too, I hope. Um, I, well, for a long time, I didn't have the perspective. Like, why is this happening? <laughs> my question. Now, at least yeah. I, under, 
I think I've answered the why to my own benefit. I know that yeah. I would be the same as those people. Right. And I'm always, always nice and polite. I, you are. I meet strangers that come into town. And if it's on the right day and I have time, I'll go down and have coffee and talk with you, share stories, whatever. Everybody's important. I'll vouch and Especially for that. younger. But younger people especially, yes. because they're like me. Whenever I see a young group of techies, I think back to those days with me and Steve Jobs trying to come up with ideas to make something on our own and, and uh, you know, and change the world a little and show it off and impress people with our knowledge of electronics and what we can do with it. And when I run into those youngsters, boy, I just want them to be so inspired, you know, to go and kick off the next changes in life. Yep. Are there people who inspired you like that, that you looked up to in that same way? No, I was I was kind of social. I was real independent, loner. It helped me think differently. I don't have to think the same way as other people. But from school on, I was just like one of those classical nerds that you're totally out of it socially. <laughs> you're not you're not in that world. And um, I heroes, my, just you know, maybe books or science fiction um, stories I read or movies I saw. Was there a book That's, that inspired you? A science fiction oh, sure. book? You, yeah. Oh yeah, Tom Swift Jr. My entire young life, very young life. I'm talking. Seven, eight, nine years old, even, you know, and a little older, and 10. Tom Swift Jr. was a guy that was young. He owned a company with his dad. And when there was a problem in the world, he would disappear into a laboratory and work on something. And he would come out with an invention that would solve the problem, whether it was a submarine or a spaceship or a plasma field to entrap an alien presence. Um, so, uh, and boy, I just, I, I always admired that. And I thought, Wow. If you're a scientist, you get to create all these things that are like, just like unimaginable. You know, and I kind of had one of these drifting minds my whole life. Just likes to kind of sit there and drift away and daydream a lot and think of, you know, fantasy is so important. When I saw things like a guy lived a fantasy life of Dungeons and Dragons and then he wrote Ultima. Yeah. And that was uh, that guy that went Lord up to the British. space station. Lord Richard, British. Richard Lord Garriott. British back then. Yep. Richard yeah. Garriott. Richard Garriott. Um, that guy, it just became a hero to me. I couldn't, I was speechless when I met him when he was like 17 years old because <laughs> he had turned a fantasy into something real. Yeah. You ever want to go in a spaceship? No. Um, <laughs> no, I, I probably would have I, at some point in my life, but um, I'm past that point. I don't need to have the hottest sports car anymore. I don't have to, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just more comfortable. There's so many great things going on in this world of technology right now. You're swamped if you think about doing anything else. But you did have a question coming up for me from somebody that you Thank introduced. you, Jonathan Rowley. Twitter. You are so good. Thank you, uh, Steve. What technological advancement do you see on the horizon affecting humanity most and its consequences? Is there something coming, biotech maybe, uh, that, that's going to change everything that we know? Well, they always talk about biotech, and that's, you know, the unknown can always be made yes. so extreme. So, right. Well, the funny thing is it's already happening so much and it happened really in the last few decades because like, let's say you had a sunspot and a big EMF burst or whatever it's called um, knocked out all of our internet and computers. Maybe it knocked out our cell phones. Where would we, how would we do the things we do in life as work? Right. Where would it all go? It would, we're very we would dependent, so aren't we? Crippled. So we're already kind of half human, half our technology. And I, I think, and like I pointed out earlier, you ask, if you have a difficult question, you used to ask a person that was intelligent. Now you ask, you do a search on Google, you get instantaneous answers, and they're often much better, much clearer, and much more information than you ever expected. So we have something equivalent to intelligence, and we didn't set out to create the Internet as a brain. We've had artificial intelligence research projects in university forever, and they just take dinky, dinky little steps all of a sudden, we have the closest thing to a part of what a brain does, and it happened by accident. And it happened because we have the number of nodes on the Internet that we have neurons in the brain, order of magnitude, and the number of network connections that we have synapses in the brain, order of magnitude. And all of a sudden, we've got sort of a part of a brain, and it doesn't have a definition. We didn't sit down and design it to be a brain. So I think that all this, this, you know, this singularity and us becoming more you know, the 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 robotic computerized world becoming a part of us it's going to happen all by accident just things that we need to do what we think is makes our own life better our own job better do you agree with and ray kurzweil that the singularity is near i don't know exactly what singularity means i'm going to be speaking with ray kurzweil in about a week in austria and on this very topic so um I can't wait i'd love I, to hear I, to, that to, to me yeah to me the singularity is is how much it's already 
you know, worked its way into our lives. And they talk about chips in our eyes someday that you'll be able to see yeah. better yeah. than any other human. Or chips in the ear and you'll hear things humans don't hear and artificial limbs that will run better than yours. And how much, I sort of see a future where some people are going to hold off and say, no, we should remain natural, kind of this, you know, very religious sense, which I don't oppose. We should remain natural humans or, and the, then the others will be modifying themselves. But, you know, we modify ourselves no matter what anyway. We dye our hair. We, we always have. Shave our beards, whatever, you know. Well, you two won't shave yours, but I... <laughs> not, for, not for now. <laughs> Steve, you said you don't need f sports cars anymore, but there was a time when you were kind of a sports car fan, and you did... I, I know you've seen this recently because Engadget did a, brought back the 70s. This is a... Uh, a Datsun Z commercial featuring somebody you might know. Steve yeah. owns two of the world's most impressive sports cars. What's your favorite, Steve? I prefer the Z. Is it that sleek styling? More than that. Is it the lush interior, the sophisticated onboard computers? That's part of it. Is it all the racing championship? Yeah. Oh, what is it about the Z car? It is awesome. <laughs> hey, Steve, you sell the apples. I'll sell the Z. <laughs> Leo, I gotta thank you for that. <laughs> it that is was, you awesome. Know that was a great time in my life. I got to see how a professional commercial is made. I got to be part of it. It's like when I was on Dancing with the Stars. I got to see what a real star trailer was and how stars are treated. Um, it's, it's a neat experience in life. And I owned quite a few Zs in that period of my life before the commercial. I mean, I have never, ever, my integrity is, oh, yeah. is I would never sell it. We um, know that. We know that. Yeah, only yeah. if I use something and like it would I ever say it's good, and you don't even have to pay me money for that. Besides the so, Segway, what are you driving these days? Um, mostly I drive my Prius, and I can fit four Segways in the Prius very easily. <laughs> um, and wherever I go, where, so wherever I go, I have my life and my Segways. If I'd rather drive, that car is so comfortable, so quiet, I don't get tired. I, ever since I drove it, I, if, if I can drive in one day, I won't fly. If, I, if it's a 12-hour drive to Salt wow. Lake City, I drive. A 12-hour really? drive to Phoenix, I drive. I don't fly. Uh, an eight-hour drive to Las Vegas, I drive instead of flying. Same thing, San Diego. So, and I love it. I just love the experience. I love the driving, the, the quietness. Um, I also still have my Hummer, my Hummer 1, H1. And it's not electric yet, but I'm kind of intrigued Ooh. by uh, the one that I read about today. Wouldn't that be and cool? I, and I have a Mercedes convertible because that's sort of like the primo production car that's not a specialty Ferrari only made in small quantities. That's, I think that's the best in the world. Would you rather have the self-driving car that Google is showing <laughs> off so that you could get that a driving experience but also get some stuff done? Or is that not – do you want to hold on? Do you want to actually have the driving experience? <laughs> I would rather have the self-driving car. Yeah. I actually, I'm starting to think with what Google's doing, it, I, I, I really doubted. I went to all those robot car races, and I kind of doubted it would really uh, ever be reliable and trustable enough. But I think Google's approach is right, which is work with the existing infrastructure, yeah. modifying the infrastructure of vehicles to put special rails down and special highways that emit signals. You'd have to have a very specialized car that can do it. No, to have one that can drive itself in today's, totally the normal infrastructure and has safety put in, I think that's going to be very popular. Look, right now, a lot of us, even in my Prius, I sit, set the cruise control and I, I set the radar distance to the car in front of me and my foot, you know, I can drive, you know, hundreds of miles on the freeway and my foot never touches the gas pedal or the brake. It, it does both jobs and I really like that. And I like pressing the little lane thing to kind of notify me if I'm uh, drifting out of my lane. So we're getting we're getting these kind of technologies, the backup the backup radar, the backup vision screens. I, I really wish it were 3D though. I'll tell you, we can <laughs> you use that for 3D. And, and and navigation systems could really make good use of a 3D display without glasses. So I'm looking for that in the future too. Steve, I don't know how we got. Into I, I don't want to get Janet mad at me. So we're gonna we're not gonna keep you forever. But I just uh, we have so many things we could talk about. I got so many questions for you on Twitter. People, you are a beloved figure in the uh, computer. Well, save industry. it for another. Save it for. Can another we do it again? Occasion? Can we do it again? Love to have you back. Steve, Does that mean in two years? No, I'm no. Now that I know how to get a hold of you, you should you should mark it down for like three months, six months, pick Deal. some time frame. You know, Steve. Yeah, I love I love doing this as much as you do, Leo. And uh -huh. I'd love to get you on Forecast. It's a show I do where I have people just t give their thoughts about the future. We kind of touched on some of that. Oh, here. you'd be so good on Forecast. You want to do that sometime? Of course, you absolutely. Do it via Skype. And and this is and I keep up with what's going on in the technology world, so I can you know usually contribute. But you know, hey, it's um easy to do when I'm at home or I'm in a hotel. 
to do these, you know, these. Well, you're videos. always welcome. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'll just go through Janet because I, I let, email you uh, pretty regularly. You, oh, let me tell you about one coming up. It was some place that wanted me to do a speech for some money. I was going to be in the Netherlands. And at 1 a.m. Netherlands time, I was going to do some video conference to their speech in Wisconsin. They sent a contract. I don't even like contracts. I, I like people like Janet to handle it for me, maybe. Yes, yeah. And the contract said that I had to put up a bond. What? For, some, for this little... Sorry, yes. and a I bond? Said, I said, <laughs> I, I never... Sorry. I don't know what's... I'm sorry. I'm the sort of guy that likes to do something on a handshake or an email. I'll show up when I show up. A you know? bond? <laughs> well, I, we did negotiate that with Janet, but I won't, I won't talk <laughs> about it uh, with you. Steve, Steve <laughs> and, and uh, Gina Smith just wrote a, a great book. If you want to know more about uh, Steve Wozniak, it's I Was, Computer Geek to Cult Icon, How I Invented the Personal Computer, Co-Founded Apple, and Had Fun Doing It. And the story is there. And it's really great. And uh, I know, you know, I uh, I was going to go to your birthday party, Steve, and at the last minute I, I realized I had a double booked because we had a Tim O'Reilly uh, government 2.0 segment, a special that we were doing in here, and I couldn't get out of it. But uh, I, I saw all the pictures Gina sent of you and the and the Bob's Big Boy cake. That looked really good. <laughs> well, thanks to Janet. Everyone who even wasn't there was there. Good. And she... She never let me know that I, I had a surprise it. party coming, so oh, she never got it. my list of who should be there. So only about half of even the people did she even know. That well, she invited me. She knew enough to invite me, and I know Gina went, and I saw a lot of it. It looked like it was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, it was. We really appreciate your time, Steve. Happy 60th. A little late for Steve 6.0, but we'll, we'll wish you a happy 60th anyway. And uh, we'll talk again very soon. Okay. And, uh, oh, by the way, you kept mentioning Janet. I am so lucky to have a wife who understands this addiction to technology <laughs> yes. and all the weird things that you do as a result of it. I think she and shares it a little bit, doesn't she? Yes, and she likes it. I sh and I share my learnings with her, too. Good. She doesn't I quite get into using every single device in the world like I do, but at least I tell her what worked and why it worked and why something that didn't work. And Well, yes. I've, known, I've known Janet, I think, longer than I've known you because uh, we went on a geek cruise many years ago, and she's just great. And you, you un, I think it was on our day, uh, our, our 24 hours of iPhone that we had you on, and you inadvertently announced that you had gotten married to Janet. <laughs> and I hope you didn't get into trouble. Well, I met that. her. No, I met her on that geek cruise that you were on. That's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, it, and yeah, and I hope you go on another geek cruise soon. We'd, we would love to see you. Steve, we, thanks we so much. We plan every geek cruise, but, you know, the calendar is getting more crowded these days. I bet it is. I bet it is. Okay, thanks, Leo. All Have the best, one. Steve. Steve Wozniak, thanks, everybody. Steve. Good night. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Well, it's so nice to talk to him. He is just... He's just a pleasure. What I he? love is he still has all this enthusiasm for life and for, um, and you know, just discovery. And you could hear almost the childlike enthusiasm. With, oh, this is how they make TV shows. And this is, yeah. you know, and he Well, just, and it's genuine. That's the absolutely. thing about it. Everything he says is genuine. So when he goes off about how much he loves his iPhone, people say, oh, well, of course he's going to say that. He means it. No, and when and he, he goes out have about a the things X. that he doesn't like, yeah. he means it. No, he's he, the guy is uh, is completely unpolitical, and that's why I really love talking to him. Yeah, I don't usually uh, like talking to CEOs of companies because uh, you know, and we didn't get around asking what he's up to. I know he's oh, right. working with <laughs> with a solid state hard drive company and stuff. We never got around to that, but we'll, we'll do it again very soon. Uh, this is going to be uh, the first of uh, what I hope will be a weekly event. Uh, we'll be talking to one of the other folks who co-founded EFF with Steve, and uh, I think uh, Mitch Capor was involved. John Perry Barlow will uh, join us next week at this same time, and we'll talk about EFF and what's going on on the Internet. And if you have ideas for other people you'd like us to interview, we'd love to hear from you. We are booking quite a few. We've got Now that we've got Eileen, who's so good. Speaking of, when he was talking about Janet, having a, a, a wife that understands technology. No kidding. You are a lucky man, Tom Merritt. She's just great. And so she's been going, doing a great job getting people. If you've got an idea, uh, you can email leo at twit.tv. Or, uh, you know, we're going to start paying attention to the pound twit live hashtag. It works so well. And I'm sorry to get to everybody's questions we had. Oh, they, yeah, I wish we could have. There were some great questions out. in there. But, uh, uh, but um, that works really well. Pound do pound twit live on twitter and, and i will pay attention to that and uh, we will try to get anybody you suggest and we have a lot of great people that we are working on uh including stephen fry so you don't have to mention him because i always get, every time i ask everybody stephen fry stephen fry we are we are absolutely working on him he's not so uh, not so easy yeah, we've got a nice long list but we're always looking for yeah, other ideas always good to have more carver mead would be great that's, ah, a, that's great a good one idea. patterson yeah. nice job yeah 
Adam Savage is, I believe, on. I don't know if he's booked yet, but he's definitely he's on the list. On the list, I think. Larry Lessig I think is it's, on the list. It's in process. Uh, Larry was very busy, but he says as soon as he comes up for air, he, we're going to have him on. Bobby Llewellyn, of course, he's an automatic. I don't think it'll be too hard to get uh, Bobby Alton Brown. You want to talk about food? He's a food geek, I guess. I, I guess it's a kind like, of you, geek. You know, Buzz Out Loud, you used to get the Alton Brown suggestion to have him on, too. What Roger McGuinn we're going to work on. Now, people, there are some people that are hard to get, and I don't know if we'll be able to get people like Steve Jobs or Johnny Ives, neither of whom do many media interviews. Corey right, Doctorow, right. I could promise we will get. Um, so we'll, we'll work on a lot. It's Tony Stark. I'd be very curious what he's up to these days. Yes. Yeah. Fictional people are fine. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we don't discriminate. <laughs> Uh, you do that on Current Geek Weekly, I think you talked to Fish. Oh, yeah. yeah. With, with myself. <laughs> That's what I thought, yeah. <laughs>